Obviously, we've been talking about this market, three years of equity declines. You've seen confidence among consumers. Foreign investors have seemed you know, cratered, to say the least. But then you see measures from the government and policymakers to put a floor across markets, across this economy, and this week, what people are calling an ambitious 5% growth target. What's business been like from your end? Uh, it has been a very busy 12 months for us. And you just mentioned that one year ago, we cried the full control of business on the ground. And we did a lot of things afterwards. We rebranded the business to JP Morgan Asset Management China. And then we moved about our 400 China staff into our Shanghai office in Shanghai Tower. And currently, we are managing over 90 mutual funds on behalf of 64 million our Chinese clients, both retail and institutional, and we are helping them invest both domestically and internationally. What is your approach in investing in China right now? Obviously, there's the long-term headwinds, but how do you square that with depressed valuations and, yeah. and pockets of opportunities? I think the benefits of our business is we are managing a diversified business. So across different client channels, across different asset classes. So you probably look at equity, but we also have fixed income. We have active. We also have a passive, like you just mentioned, the ETF. Hmm. So we are approaching the different market, different asset classes in a different way. And what strategies are doing well? You take a look at your funds, with, whether it's fixed income, equities, mutual funds. Yeah. Are, are, are the, the high dividend yield plays, is that still going to be the winning strategies in 2024? Yeah, I think high dividend and clients asking for, um, for income definitely will still continue to play. And I think it's just a new rising trend at, the, at this, this moment. And very interestingly is if you look at the risk appetite, I think when you started, you, you talk about risk appetite. If you think about the two years of um, market equity market declining, definitely the risk appetite will be relatively low. And we see the, if you look at the mutual fund um, industry, the equity fund, active equity fund, AUM, actually dropped from at the peak, which is the end of 2021, represents about 24% of the whole industry AUM. And now it's about 14% of the whole AUM. Um, and however, we are seeing the AUM for other asset classes mm. like money market funds, uh, fixed income, both active and passive, and passive equity, including ETF you just mentioned. Actually, the AUM is rising. So we are seeing the whole mutual fund industry AUM actually is still growing year on year. And can you believe it? In 2023, the AUM for the whole mutual fund industry actually grew 6%. Wow, okay. Yeah. Um, what's still needed then for China to really regain that heft in global portfolios? What are conversations with clients like now? Oh. I think clients, we have different type of clients, so different type of conversations. And interestingly is when the market slow down, people start to think. So we see a lot of clients, they are using um, over the past years, they are trying to reflect on how we should invest better, how we should sell our products better, etc. So actually it's a great timing for us, JP Morgan, because um, a lot of clients are currently start to look at overseas investment, overseas experience for a potential answer, area for diversification or area for potential improvement. Yeah, that brings me to QDII, yeah. which is one of the only sort of channels for onshore asset managers to really provide products with foreign exposure. Mm. And it's really been in the spotlight these days because you have seen a yeah. surge in demand yeah. when it comes to you know, ETF premiums have surged. You see demand for offshore products as well. What are you seeing from your end in terms of demand right now? Um, it's not surprising to us because um, we see all the investors, all the money are always trying to chase a better alpha and a better um, beta opportunities. That's the nature of investments. And we do, as you mentioned, we do see rising demand for offshore investment. And if you look at the interest rate differential between China and the U.S., and Bloomberg keep reporting every day, like Japan equity all-time high, U.S. equity all-time high, definitely. And I think it's a good thing for clients to consider the diversification in their portfolio. Because actually, I keep talking to our clients that um, the Chinese household's portfolio have too little percentage in offshore investments, too much strong home equity buyers. So actually, um, this is good for their, um, the health of their overall portfolio. Mm. Um for regulators, I'm guessing that, that might raise some alarm bells about capital outflows. Are, are you hearing any sense 
uh, are any signs of slowing quotas when it comes to QD or QDLP? Um, not really. I think the process has always been on track, and we've been speaking to them um, on a constant basis. And regulators here, I think they are trying to make sure the two-way flow are, are both open and available to investors. For example, we talk about the um, outbound the QD flow, but if you look at the other side of the flow story, like the inbound, if you look at the, um, the northbound for the Stock Connect, that's a, a index people keep tracking, looking at the inbound for inbound flow. And ever since the China equity market bottomed up on February 5th, we seen the inbound from the northbound flow for February, the single one yeah. month, is about, um, I think, 60 billion renminbi, yeah. exceeding the whole number for the whole year, 2022, 44 billion renminbi. So basically, we think that as long as the market is doing well, the, the flow naturally follow where they want to go. I, I want to talk a little more about just regulatory the environment right now. I mean, you, you do have a QD ETF that um, tracks the S&P 500. You've been trying to get approval of since late September. I believe it's still pending. Are, are you worried that regulators are scrutinizing some of these products now? Um, no, they have a different pace for approving different products. Uh, we also have this um, last November, the Hong Kong Lowell High Dividend ETF being launched, which is also attracting the money to invest in uh, doing the low vol and high dividend, which you talk, talk about the income thing yeah. um, play to that. And that IPO went pretty well. Okay. Uh, let's talk about another IPO, which is your ETF okay. that you just uh, launched recently, the A50 ETF. Yeah. Uh, you are the first 100% foreign-owned fund house uh, that is issuing this onshore. Yeah, we are the only 100% yeah. uh, foreign-owned fund house doing the local ETF business as well. Yeah. How has it been so far? That's good. In terms of fundraising. It's good. We haven't, as you mentioned, the fund will be, the ETF will be listed next Tuesday. Yeah. So we are busily prepared for that. I mean, growing an ETF business in China, I'm guessing, is not easy. You have a lot of fierce competition from local ETF issuers. Yeah. You have also volatility in this market that could impact uh, ETF performance as well. What yeah. is your strategy to gather more assets in the mainland? Oh, I think you have to work harder and smarter. Um, for example, one thing we are reflecting on how we can do things better is we attach a lot of our importance to investor education. Um, so basically, for example, for this uh, single IPO, we did more than hundreds of offline training briefings to our clients to make sure that they know what they are buying mm. and they know the understand the index that they are buying. Yeah. Um, in terms of fees, I mean, do you, is that something that you think are competitive enough right now? You know, I think we've heard from other analysts saying you know, that there might be some sort of fundraising war just given so much interest into ETFs among investors now. Do you see, foresee something like that? Uh, what do you mean? The fee, the management fee for the... Or fundraising wars or at least fees being, oh. uh, you know, a, a, a race to the bottom in some ways. Uh, that's actually what uh, had been level play for us. Okay. Because um, we have, we never do that like the local stuff. Mm. Um, what we do is um, we do the trainings, we talk to brokers, we uh, have a solid relationship and um, full, spoke, full uh, bloom kind of a uh, partnership with our brokers. But we don't, I, I'm not sure the fee you're talking about, but if that's talk about like brokerage commission, those mm. type of thing, yeah. and we never do that. And the good thing is the regulator is eliminating that at the moment. So it help level play the whole industry. That's. And who are you going to be targeting? Is it more retail audience, domestic or institutional investors? You mean for that specific product yeah. or broadly? ETF. This oh, for ETF. Yeah. We're going to start with um, domestic clients. Okay. And for example, the specific ETF we're talking about, the CSI A50, so that index and ETF could be listed offshore through the um, uh, ETF Connect. Um, so it would be available for global investors at the next stage. Mm. But for the first stage, we target the domestic investors, um, could be retail for the IPO, and the institutional money will come in afterwards. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a bit about the, the business overall, that you know, there's no plans from JP Morgan Asset Management to really you know, materially expand the business or even downsize right now. Is that still the strategy when it comes to, to talent and hiring? Um, 
I think we try to material expand our business if we can make our the growth story really work well. And we do focus a lot on growing the business, making sure that we have the right products for our clients. Um, and, 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 and I think we're on the right track. What sort of new products could be in the pipeline? Is it mutual um, funds? Is it ETFs that you're looking at? Yeah, right both. Now? Both? Yeah. As okay. I mentioned, that we, are, we are running a diversified business. Yeah. So we're doing both mutual funds and ETFs, and both equity and fixed income, active and passive. Um, in terms of hiring, I mean, obviously there's been reports about you know, local banks, mm. brokerages that have you know, had to be faced with a bit of austerity, um, with, with China cracking down on some of these, what they call hedonistic bankers. And so compensations have been cut. This is an economy where there's little to no inflation right now. Right. Um, what are you seeing in terms of your wages and bonuses? Um, you know, it, do you feel the pressure to follow suit? Uh, no, not really. We are quite committed and allowed to offer our locally competitive um, package to our people. And we do think that for, as I mentioned, business actually probably for our whole financial industry, people is our most important asset. Okay. So, um, we are committed to be competitive on this, and we are com committed to keep hiring the top talents in the market. Um, and we're still doing that. So you're going to be hiring this year, headcount-wise? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Better than last year? Um, depends. Because okay. we continuously review our business and evaluate where is the need for um, talents. And we where is the need right now, do you think? Um, we are focusing more on investment research um, and some parts of the distribution. Great. Yeah.